The 1930s saw a veritable explosion in aircraft development. New construction techniques in aircraft and rapidly improving power plants meant that the effective lifespan of many military aircraft was measured in only a handful of years. Recognising this, the Royal Air Force was basically issuing specifications for a new aircraft before the previously requested one was even in service. Specification P13-36 was a classic example of this. Issued in 1936, this called for a new twin-engine medium bomber for, quote, worldwide use, that would supplant the aircraft that were just then prototyping for the same role. The Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, Hadley Page Hampton and Vickers Cressy, which was subsequently renamed the Wellington. The new aircraft was to have a cruising speed of 275 miles per hour at 15,000 feet and carry a minimum bomb load of 8,000 pounds or two 18-inch torpedoes. The specification also called for the ability to conduct shallow dive bombing and be capable of catapult-assisted launch, though these requirements would be dropped later. Potentially a huge contract, most of the major British aircraft builders submitted designs, but in early 1937, the Air Ministry announced that they had selected the winner. The Avro Type 679, subsequently named the Manchester. However, because they didn't want to put all their eggs in one particular basket, they also commissioned the Hadley Page HP56 design as a backup. Because of the concerns over the situation in Europe in mid-1937, the Air Ministry ordered both designs straight off the drawing board before the prototypes were even built. The Manchester appeared to have great potential. Avro had begun preliminary development work even before the awarding of the contract and so was able to deliver the first prototype in 1939. The aircraft was built with an emphasis on toughness and repairability. Its fuselage was constructed with a gridwork of longerons and stringers throughout, covered with an aluminium skin that was flush riveted. The production Manchesters would also have armour plate for the crew and self-sealing tanks in the wings. Avro looked at several different engines to power the Manchester, including the Bristol Hercules and Centaurus radials, but ultimately they settled on the Rolls-Royce Vulture. This was a 24-cylinder X-block engine that represented the very latest in development. Designed to produce 1,750 horsepower at a time when top-end service fighter engines were producing 1,000 horsepower, the Vulture looked to perfectly match the needs of the future high-performance twin-engine bomber. The second Manchester prototype flew in May 1940 and was fitted with the initially proposed defensive armament of front, rear and ventral Frazier Nash turrets, each fitted with two 303 Browning machine guns. Because of the rapid decision to order 300 Manchesters for production in 1937, this prototype barely got into testing before the first production aircraft was delivered in August 1940. These, the Mark I Manchester, switched the armament to twin-gun turrets in nose, dorsal and tail turrets. Rather distinctively, issues with the twin tail meant the Mark I's, of which 20 were built, were fitted with a large vertical stabiliser. However, even as these were under construction, the improved Mark I-A's started building alongside them. These reverted to the twin-fin system but used taller fins and rudders mounted in a new tailplane, which had its span increased by 50%. The Mark one As also altered the armament to twin 303 Browning machine guns in nose and dorsal turrets, and a four-gun tail turret. Maximum bomb load was 10,350 pounds in the huge bomb bay that took up the majority of the fuselage. By this point, the Second World War was raging, the British Army had been driven from the continent, and Bomber Command was the primary way for the UK to strike at Germany. So, the need for the Manchester, a powerful and fast bomber, was critical. Orders for the aircraft had been substantially increased, with a total of 700 now to be produced on four major production lines. As a result, qualification into the RAF was fast, and on the night of the 24th-25th of February 1941, the Manchester went into action, bombing the French port of Brest and it soon became apparent that the aircraft was, 
a total lemon. In fact, that had been the expectation for a while, but desperation to field as many modern aircraft as possible had driven the Manchester along. The problem lay in the Vulture engine. As said, this represented the cutting edge in power plant development when it first ran in 1937. Unfortunately, it was just too complex for the technology of the time. Composed essentially of two Kestrel V12 engines powering a common crankshaft, the Vulture proved prone to catastrophic failure. Initially, the engine was derated to 1,400 horsepower to try to prolong lifespan, but even this proved ineffective, and the Vulture doomed the Manchester. Reliability was so bad that the aircraft were grounded in April 1941, two months after first fielding, as attempts to deal with the high incidences of bearing failure took place. This had to be repeated in June, and the RAF was having to resort to using aircraft like the Hadley Page Hampton that the Manchester had been intended to replace. In November 1941, the Manchester was cancelled. Total production had been two prototypes and 200 production aircraft. Its service record reflected its unfortunate power plant choice. Of the 193 aircraft that saw operational use, 78 were lost in action. Another 45 were lost in accidents, of which 30 involved engine failure. In other words, in the midst of a major conflict, 37% of Manchester's were lost due to their terrible engine. Manchester's flew 1,269 sorties with Bomber Command, dropping 1,657 metric tonnes of bombs. Flying their last operation against Bremen on 25th of June 1942, the Manchester had a front-line life of only 18 months and paid a heavy price for it in aircraft and crew. But despite this dreadful service record, the Manchester was to prove hugely successful. Sort of. Remember how I said earlier that Handley Page had been asked to build their aircraft as a backup to the Manchester? Well, in 1937, and recognising even back then that the Vulture might prove a problem, they redesigned their aircraft to take four lower-powered engines instead. This led to the development of the Handley Page Halifax Heavy Bomber, which entered service in November 1940. This would provide the RAF with one of its most important aircraft for the bomber offensive against Germany, but it also pointed the way for another aircraft that would ultimately become legend. With problems all too apparent with the Manchester, Avro and the Air Ministry needed to find a solution fast. If the Halifax could be redesigned for four engines, maybe the Manchester could too. After all, the aircraft had many excellent attributes, only being let down by its engines. So, Avro took one of the early Mark I Manchesters and modified it to test the idea. Designated the Manchester Mark III, this aircraft was a tremendous success, vastly superior to the other Manchesters. So the decision was made to switch production to the new aircraft, including altering the Manchesters being built already. It was also decided to give the new aircraft a new name to distance it from its unfortunate forebear, the Avro Lancaster. I'm guessing you've heard of it. And here lay the final service that the Manchester provided. As the aircraft was essentially identical to the Lancaster in crew layout and equipment, the Manchester was able to serve on until 1943 as a familiarisation trainer for aircrew transitioning to the new heavy bomber. And that is the story of the Avro Manchester, a graphic example of how the line between a terrible aircraft and a great one can be very fine indeed.